good. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining WCAP's GAD Global Advocacy and Diplomacy Working Group. I see that everyone is trickling in. We're super excited to have all of you join us today for our Foreign Service Officer Series 101. For those of you who joined us last month, we talked a little bit about debunking the myths for the Foreign Service Examination. And our speaker, Jack Busby, actually um, gave five free memberships to WCATS members. And we have a couple of those left. So if you guys are interested in that, please um, send us an email at gadwg at wcaps.org and we'll make sure you guys are connected to that amazing resource. And we'll go ahead and get started in about one minute. All right, fantastic. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Global Advocacy and Diplomacy's March monthly chapter meeting. As you know, we have these meetings every first Tuesday of the month. We are kicking off our FSO series. We actually started last month. Um, today, we have amazing guest diplomats, Miss Victoria Duganalo-Latotu and Miss Malika Rufe who's going to share some amazing insights into their journey into the foreign service and answer a lot of the questions that you all have been sharing with us last year as pertains to some of the myths that you've heard. Um, and we hope that after the end of the series in the spring that you all will consider entering the service um, and represent our amazing country from that role. I am Maritza Adonis. For those of you who don't know me, I am the chair for Global Advocacy and Diplomacy Working Group. We also have our founder and executive director, Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, um, on the line as well too. Ambassador Bonnie, would you like to offer a welcome to our attendees for today's program? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, sorry I'm not on the screen, everyone. Um, um, but I just got off, I just finished teaching a class, so I'm kind of like stretching and walking around. <laughs> so thank you for doing this. Of course, thank you, Maritza, for uh, always arranging such amazing panels. You are just amazing the ones that you do. Uh, thanks to these wonderful uh, ladies who are going to be speaking and helping us learn about the uh, Foreign Service. I look forward to seeing all of you, uh, you know, who are at state if and when I do arrive. <laughs> Um, hopefully pretty soon. So thank you everyone and uh, turn it back over to you, Maritza. Thanks so much, Ambassador Ronnie. And congratulations again. We're, ex we're having mixed feelings. We're super ecstatic for you, but and, well, we know that you're not going to leave WCAP. So actually it's no more uh, mixed feelings. <laughs> no more mixed feelings. We're super ecstatic for you, for your new role um, that's coming up soon. Um, so we always start our GAD meetings with an icebreaker. Um, for today's timing, we know we have so many questions. We will have all of you all share your respective videos and introduce yourselves. So a couple of you all can share your videos but everyone else should in the chat box, just type your name. Where are you joining us from today? I myself, I'm joining from DC. Um, which country that you would love to travel to if you could pick up your bags tomorrow? And if you're fluent in any other language besides English. So I'll actually um, go ahead and start that off. So my name is Maritza Donis. I am checking in from DC. The country, if I could pick up and if I could pack my bags tomorrow and travel to would be Lithuania. It's one of my favorite Eastern European countries. Actually, it's freezing right now. It's dark. <laughs> Maybe not Lithuania. Uh, I would go to Haiti. I changed that. <laughs> I changed my answer. Um, Haiti, because uh, it's really warm right now. And languages that I have working knowledge of our Spanish, Haitian Creole, Lithuanian, um, a little bit of Russian, but I won't count that, only when I need it. Mandarin, and that's about it. 
Oh, French. I gotta forget French. Okay, French. All right, so just put that in the chat box. Um, let's see who else we have here. Okay, we have Ariel joining us from Chicago. Awesome. Um, oh, you're coming to support one of your cousins, diplomat La Tortu Dugana, who's joining us today. Thank you so much for joining. Let's see who else we have in the chat box. Um, don't be shy, guys. And for those of you that want to introduce yourself out loud, you can do that. Feel free to share your video and you can just jump on. Um, we have Aria. I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name. Also in Chicago. Okay, a lot of the shy town folks are checking in. Awesome. Ooh, you have a very nice language. Um, I can't even pronounce some of those languages. Okay, Ira, I'm gonna call you out. If you don't mind introducing yourself formally, um, your name, where you're calling from, <laughs> if you could pick up and go to a country, what that be? And tell us more about your languages. That looks like an awesome list and I can't pronounce um, some of them. Hi, I was actually invited um, by Ariel. Um, and uh, my name is Ira Lezakino. I use she, her, hers. I am a civic engagement project leader um, for City Year Chicago. Uh, we are an educational um, an educational intervention, like not for profit. I'm an aspiring diplomat, and um, I would love to visit Morocco, um, in, like maybe for like a month because it's just such a big country. And um, so I speak Ilocano, Tagalog, and English. Like I grew up speaking three, and then I picked up Spanish, Mandarin. Um, and because of my work in um, in north of Spain, I learned Basque. But I also like know Korean as well. Wow, amazing. So we definitely would love to invite you to our future guide lingos. Um, and I'll, sh I'll, I'll show a little bit more about what that is in a little bit, but that's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, we also have Rachel. Hi, Rachel from Alexandria, Virginia. She's in the, the belt along with me. Um, she would love to go to Norway and some languages she have in her back pocket outside of English are Arabic and Italian. Oh, cool. Very, very, very nice. Um, Ashley from Maryland wants to go to Colombia, speaks French, mm -hmm. Turkish and Mandarin, Ona from Chicago. Hi, Alma from Mexico. Alma, do you want to introduce yourself? Alma's one of our very active WCAPS member who actually just got uh, Hi. Hi, article Rachel. published. You just got your article published in our National Security Working Group, which is the working group that Ambassador Ronnie founded and chairs. So congratulations to you for that publication. Do you want to introduce yourself? And So the quick elevator pitch is that I am uh, a recovering classroom teacher, a coding bootcamp survivor, and a cybersecurity enthusiast. My background is in international relations. I worked as an international educator up until 2019. Um, so I have actually done, like I've, I've taken the foreign service exam and a couple of times. So when this email came through, I was like, oh, maybe I owe it to myself to just check in again and see how, you know, what changes have happened in the State Department in terms of the Foreign Service track. And also uh, to learn a little bit more on the tech side. I know that there's like a technical side to uh, the Foreign Service. So I thought I would give myself the opportunity to to come by and just, you know, learn a little bit more about something that I thought I knew about, but maybe I don't. So thank you, Maritza, for calling on me and hello to everybody. And thank you, Ambassador Jenkins, for joining us as well. I'm sure you, you've got a lot on your plate. So it's great to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much. I see there's a huge Chicago delegation that's joining us here. Frida also from Chicago. Um, fluent in Russian and Spanish. Oh, awesome. Some Portuguese and Burmese. Um, we have a couple folks from DC. Alina, um, if you could travel anywhere tomorrow, you'll go to Italy. You've been, you've been watching Stanley. Okay, Alina, tell us more about that. You'll be on our final um, participant today. We'll call on live or Atina. Excuse me, I think I might be pronouncing that incorrectly. But share, share with us more about 
why you're looking to go to Italy. Ritz, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've been watching um, Stanley Tucci's show on CNN where he travels to, I think, six different regions in Italy and is just eating food and drinking delicious looking, you know, drinks and eating um, desserts. And so it just really made me want to drop everything in, in particular, go to Southern Italy to the Amalfi Coast and just have some really fresh food and enjoy the nice weather. Mm, nice. What are some of your languages? Um, I, so I studied French. Um, my, my father is actually, um, he was born in Cameroon. And so there's like a, a cultural connection. It's a Francophone country. And so I studied French um, all throughout college. Last summer, I was taking a Spanish class with a local organization here, but I decided to go back to French after we were doing a lot of sort of grammar and stuff. I thought, you know what, let me, let me go back to what I know. Um, but French and, and, and a little bit of Spanish. I've, I've traveled to a few Spanish speaking countries and, and tried to pick it up for that reason. Nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I see you're part thank of the you. Chicago delegation, I believe. <laughs> DC. I'm, I'm in DC, actually. In DC? Okay, yes. awesome. Okay, okay. All right. Chicago is trying to take over today, which we love because we're so used to having so many folks from the district. So we love all the diversity. We also have Mia from California who wants to go to Martinique. She's learning French. Um, Jordan in North Carolina. North Carolina. She wants to go to Peru. She's learning um she knows Spanish fluently, but she's learning French, Italian, Mandarin. Ooh, love it. Another polyglot like myself. Um, fantastic. All right. So a little bit of old business. Um, last week, as I mentioned, we started off our FSO series talking about cracking the foreign service exam. Jack Busby of FSO Compass shared so many great insights. And the biggest takeaway for me was that the examination is free. And no one is counting it against you in terms of how many times you take it. So that was really interesting to know because a lot of the attendees um, shared that, you know, they were really nervous about it and they didn't know if, you know, if they took it multiple times, if that would count against them or if there was um, an economic barrier to taking the examination. So those are my top two, um, two takeaways. If you wanted to get some of the notes from that meeting, if you just send an email to GAD Working Group or GADWG at WCATS.org, which is also in the chat box. And we'll make sure we send you the notes from that last meeting. We'll also talk about officer recruitment. GAD is actually celebrating its first year with WCATS. Thankfully, um, Master Bonnie created a, an amazing space for us to create these amazing working groups. Um, and so we are now officially starting our, actually our first officer recruitment. Our initial officer team are all part of our founders. Um, and many of them are going to be transitioning to the administration. We're super ecstatic and a couple have conflict of interest. So, which means we have an opportunity to bring in some amazing new officers. Some of the roles are co-chair, um, protocol officer, Officer, which kind of serves as the officer that's going to welcome a lot of our speakers, um, serve as the point of contact between our speakers for programming, um, also serve as part of marketing as well too. Programs officer, which helps us curate some of these amazing programs like our GAD Lingo, our Advocacy and Diplomacy Summits that we, we've held in the past and other um, upcoming series that we're planning on. Um, WCAPS liaison, for those of you who are new to WCAPS, um, WCAPS is an extremely large organization. And so um, we thought it was very essential for us to have a dedicated officer within our team whose sole role was to communicate with all of our chapters, all of our fellow working groups, um, and make sure that we're not missing anything as pertains to WCAPS initiatives, and that we're also in line with any of the programs um, that Ambassador Bonnie or our leadership team at HQ may have for that given period. And we also have communications and marketing officer, um, which we have one of our goddesses, um, Shayna, who's serving in that role today, um, who just basically manages a lot of our meetings. Um, and they serve as a liaison between our membership. So I know a lot of, for the past couple of months, our members have been wanting to find ways to become more engaged. Well, we're going to bring someone on the team whose role is gonna be exclusively to engage with all of you. Um, some of our new business, uh, we are going to be kicking off 
a couple more series. So we have an advocacy series that's gonna be focusing on ambassador appointments. If you're part of our Gaddis um, chat, um, for the past couple of weeks, it's been really exciting. Um, in that chat, folks have been talking about the importance of ensuring that we have women of color um, to serve in the new ambassadorship appointments that are coming up. And so we'll be doing a couple of series just to kind of talk about um, the benefits of making sure we have diversity in these roles. Our first one that we'll actually kick off um, in May, we'll actually be focusing on why a woman of color should serve as ambassador to China, since that's one of the, the key roles that's currently vacant. And, um, and our next series is diplomacy series. So one of the, the questions that we received on in our GAD membership profile was that our members wanted to know more about diplomacy. So we're going to kick off a series that highlights each area of diplomacy, so economic, cultural, um, and so on and so forth. GAD lingo, for those of you, again, who are new to WCAPS or GAD, we kicked off our cultural diplomacy program last year. And essentially what that is, is that we give our WCAPS members an opportunity to get a little bit of an insight into a culture and into language. So we invite a diplomat from the embassy or the ambassador, him or herself from that respective country's embassy to share with us some of the foods, some of the weather, the people, culture. Um, and then the other half of that programming is an actual intro into that actual language. So in the past, we've done French, Spanish, Japanese, Haitian Creole, um, and we're looking to bring back French at the end of this month. So look out for our advertising for that. Um, we're going to bring back Spanish. That was a really popular one. So there's some of the languages you guys shared with us today. We're taking notes to see um, some languages that our existing membership already have experience in and some that they might be interested in so that we can bring um, more of that programming to all of you. Um, and then finally, our programs coming up in April, we'll be focusing on climate change. So we're actually partnering with one of our um, climate change working groups with WCAPS. We're going to kick off a program right after um, uh, Mr. Carey uh, provides his speech for on behalf of the United States. For most of you that's been keeping track of that, the United States decided to re-enter into the Paris Agreement. And so we want to talk a bit more about the implications of that and where to next. So if you're interested in climate diplomacy or climate change in general, um, that's a good program to keep tabs in. And also we'll be looking at MENA. So last year we focused our Global Advocacy and Diplomacy Summit on Latin American and Caribbean. This year we're going to focus on MENA in Asia. So our first summit that's going to happen in early summer um, will be focused on MENA. So if you're interested in that region and want to be involved in that planning process, again, just send an email to gadwg at wcaps.org. Now we're going to turn it over to what you all have um, joined us today, and that's for our FSO Series 101, Debunking the Myths of Entering the Foreign Service with our special guest diplomats, um, Victoria Latoti Dugana and Malika Rufai. Um, and so just to share a little bit about both of them, um, Diplomat Rufai has served as an FSO officer since 2014, and she's currently the North Macedonia desk officer in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs Office of South Central Europe. She also sits on the board of the Pickering and Wrangel Fellows Association, also known as PR PRFA, as a professional development chair. She previously served as a watch officer in the operations center during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Prior in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, she worked on a range of consular portfolios and in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam with the cultural affairs officer, managing programs focusing on policy priorities such as entrepreneurship, education, and rule of law. In her professional capacity, she has studied French, Haitian Creole, and Vietnamese. Um, Diplomat Rufai is a native of Chicago. Ah, that explains the Chicago representation. Okay. <laughs> um, and she's a graduate of Spelman College and the John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, also known as SICE. Diplomat Lato Tu joined the U.S. Department of State in 2017. She is an economic assistant at the U.S. Embassy in Kuala Lumpur, Kuala Lumpur Malaysia. 
a political assistant in the Office of Arabian Peninsula Affairs, a political human rights officer at the U.S. Embassy in Algiers, Algeria, and most recently as an Algeria and Libya desk officer in the Office of North African Affairs. So these are the roles she served in previously. She's currently now, her assignment is um, serving at the Office of North African Affairs. Her next assignment is as Vice Counsel, congratulations, at the U.S. Embassy Branch Office in Tel Aviv. Diplomat Latotu du Ghana is a proud recipient of the Thomas R. Pickering Foreign Affairs Graduate Fellowship, the United Nations Association Graduate Fellowship, and the Penn Kemble Forum for Democracy Fellowship. Prior to joining government, Diplomat Latotu du Ghana received a Master of Arts in Security Policy Studies from GW's Elliott School of International Affairs and a Bachelor of Arts in Politics, Economics, and Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies from NYU. Latatu um, Dugana speaks French and Arabic and is learning Hebrew. She's also first generation Guyanese American from Picatawa, New Jersey. In her free time, she enjoys reading, cooking, and traveling with her husband and newborn son, who I got to meet a couple of weeks ago. Welcome, Diplomat Srufai and Diplomat Dugana Latatu to our program for today. Oh, we have a survey. How exciting. Yes, yes, yes. How are you guys feeling today? I am amazing. How are you? Doing well. Enjoying the nice weather. We're super ecstatic to have both of you join us. Diplomat, lots of TD can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Okay, fantastic. So as I shared with you all, um, our members have been expressing their interest in either joining the foreign service or expressing their fear of joining the foreign <laughs> service um, and actually called us out a couple months ago in terms of, hey, you guys are the diplomacy working group for WCATS, but you guys haven't done anything in foreign service. And for us, we thought, oh, of course, everyone within WCATS would know what that is. But when we did a poll, we realized that actually many of our young professional members um, had no clue what it was. And, and those that did know were had a lot of story. They heard from someone else. <laughs> um, resoundingly, we heard from a lot of them that were ecstatic mm -hmm. about joining and wanted us to do this program. So we're really excited to have both of you because I know that both of you guys have different paths to the foreign service. Um, also work in different cones as well too, which you guys will share a little bit more about what that means. But the first question, just to make sure that everyone's on the same playing field is, what is an FSO? What is a foreign service officer? And we'll start with um, with you, um, Diplomat Tugana Lato too. What is an uh, Sure, so, um... A foreign service officer or U.S. diplomat is an official of the U.S. government who works overseas on behalf of the U.S. government, promoting American interests, um, protecting American citizens. And um, those are basically the crux of what foreign service officers do. They do them uh, in different manners. Uh, consular officers, which is a job that I'll go to next. Uh, a lot of our work focuses on protecting American citizens. Um, because we'll give, we'll provide emergency and non-emergency services to American overseas, such as during the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of consular officers assisted and facilitated evacuations and repatriations. But they also provide birth certificates, um, adoptions. And we also do visa adjudications for foreign nationals who seek to enter the United States. And through visa adjudications, we can combat human trafficking, combat fraud, um, just for some examples. And then you have political officers, economic officers who focus on the political and economic situation in country. Um, so through various means, we basically promote American um, interests and advance our interests and pr protect US citizens. Awesome. So um, diplomats, Rufai, Rufe, oh my gosh. Rufai, um, Rufai. <laughs> um, what is not a foreign service officer? Like what are some things you've heard um, people 
think that foreign service officers might do, but they totally do not do that. Oh gosh, so many things. But I think um, my favorite, my favorite uh, kind of myth about FSOs or diplomats is that we spend a lot of time standing around schmoozing at cocktail parties, um, which I really genuinely wish we did. <laughs> um, but while of course networking is a huge part of what we do and building relationships with uh, folks in country and leaders um, is a huge part of what we do, that's such a small, small percentage of the actual work that takes place on the ground. And um, oftentimes I think what folks don't realize is, you know, we're in the same places as you see our military. We're in the same places and we're often in, um, you know, in similar circumstances, but with less protection um, because our job is to be tactile. Our job is to build relationships with people, um, you know, in a, in a face-to-face -face fashion. So obviously, as you can imagine, COVID has impacted the way we do our work, um, but it hasn't, it hasn't removed the necessity of having those in-person interactions or, or building those relationships. So, I think that one of the one of the main central things that uh, is a myth that I've heard often is really that it's this kind of cushy lifestyle. And there's so many things that are wonderful wonderful about the foreign service that are definite privileges, um, but it is hugely challenging as well, and um, and also just can be really difficult depending on on where you're going and what kind of work you're doing. So Matt, last to you, Gana, any things that you've heard that's like, oh no, that is definitely not what an FSO does. Um, I think Malika uh, basically explained that pretty well. That is one of the biggest misconceptions about diplomats overseas. And um, she really explained what we actually do and why it can be so challenging with the example that we are in many places where the military is, but oftentimes with less protection. That one is a, that one's very new to me. I've, I didn't realize that you guys are in often places that the military are also mm -hmm. small too. So I should, next time I meet a diplomat, I should tell them, thank you for your service. Like I do with anyone that I meet um, who has served in the military who are currently in active duty. Um, so one of the things that came up in our discussion was that there are actually cones um, or the foreign service, like what are cones? Like, what does that mean exactly? And if you can, um, um, I'll start with um, diplomat Rufe, if you can maybe like give us an overview of what the cones are and then turn it over to diplomat Latitude Grena to highlight the cone that she works in and then we'll toss it back over. So diplomat Rufe, can you give us an overview? Of what, are, what are cones exactly? So it's Rufe, it's like roof and I, it's confusing, but, <laughs> but that's how you pronounce it. Um, and uh, thanks for the question, because this is, this is one that I get so often. So our cones, cones is, is really another way of saying kind of career track. And so within the Foreign Service, um, as a generalist, you can choose from these five different specializations that we refer to as cones. And so um, Victoria already covered um, a few of them when she discussed the political cone, she, she uh, touched on economic counselor that she's going into for her next assignment. I myself am a public diplomacy officer and we also have management officers. So those are the five um, specializations or cones that, um, that we can choose um, as generalists. That also means that when you think about the fact that you know, we're generalists, I think often when we talk about foreign service officers, um, it's not often addressed that there are also specialists. And so as generalists, we are able to work in any of these five cones and throughout the course of our career. Whereas a specialist, for example, if you were uh, an IT specialist, you would be singularly focused on working in, in IT throughout the course of you know, your long career in the foreign service. Or if you are a human rights, or, or sorry, uh, um, if you're an HR professional, um, then you might be focused on uh, working in the HR shops around the globe for the course of your career. So I just emphasize that because people often think 
that if you don't fall into these categories or if you have a different background, perhaps you're an engineer, that there isn't a space for you in the foreign service and there very much is. So I really encourage everyone to, if you're interested um, and you do want to look at something that's more of a specialization, um, go ahead and, and take a look at the that, at careers.state.gov um, to get some more information on some of those specializations. But to turn it back to those five cones, um, I'll start with my own. Um, as a public diplomacy officer, my job is to build relationships with the people. It's to strengthen the people to people ties between the United States and whatever country that I'm operating in. My job is also to communicate US foreign policy. So we're not just, um, we're not just programmatic officers, we're not just program managers, but we're also press officers, we're information officers. And so I'll talk more about this later about kind of what led me to this particular career track, but one of the things that I enjoy most about public diplomacy is that you are charged with understanding the entire mission and everyone else's job in order to effectively communicate what's actually happening on the ground and to message accordingly. Um, so I'll start there. I'll, I'll let Victoria take, um, uh, take her cone and then we can, we can kind of divvy up the others. Sure thing, thank you. Um, so political officers, uh, our bread and butter is understanding what's happening in the country, whether it's the political, social, economic, situation and interpreting that and communicating that to policymakers in Washington, D.C. Um, so to give an example, when I was a political officer in Algeria, I had to keep like understand what was happening in terms of uh, unprecedented mass protest movement and political change and think critically about it and relay my analysis and any policy recommendations to policymakers here in Washington, DC for our like main foreign policy engine to, um, um, to basically create or alter our foreign, adapt, that's the word, to adapt our foreign policy um, as the political situation uh, developed. Thank you. So we, you guys heard a little, bit, a little bit about the political cone and public diplomacy cone. I know some of the other ones you mentioned were management. Can you tell us about what does that cause under the jurisdiction of the cone of management? Um, so management officers are Excellent. Um, they're highly strategic often, um, highly organized individuals, and they really lead all of our operations. So everything from real estate and procurement to managing people, a management officer, all of that falls within their bailiwick. So when we are overseas, for example, and, um, and we're trying to figure out how do we house all of these officers that move overseas, where should we house them? For what reasons? Do we have resources to, uh, to service these homes? A management officer has to think about all of that. They have to think about the daily operations of how we um, set ourselves up for success and what conditions need to be necessary for the mission to function um, efficiently. So that's gonna be just kind of the general overview of what a management officer uh, does Awesome. Um, Diplomat Lato I don't know if you want to tackle the consular cone since that's what you're transitioning into. Can you share sure with us a little bit more about your new role? Yeah. Um, and I'm very excited to talk about that because I'm very excited to go into consular work um, in about like eight months. So, as consular officers, as I mentioned before, we can provide emergency and non emergency services. So, if you are a US citizen abroad and you lose your passport, if the unfortunate event you end up getting arrested and go to prison or you have a baby abroad or want to adopt a child, um, we can help with those situations among others. And then 
a bigger part of our portfolio are is visa, visa adjudication. So when people, when other foreign nationals want to come to the United States for tourism purposes, to study at a U.S. university, to potentially get married, um, or to reunite with their families, um, whether it's immigration or uh, non-immigration purposes, consular officers uh, will adjudicate those visa visas in a sense, basically issue those visas or decide not to issue those visas. What are you most excited about this new transition? We felt the energy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's quite different um, than political work. I'm excited for the change, but I also think um, it'll be very fascinating work to, you know, help American citizens in that manner on such like adoptions would be very exciting and impactful. But also after serving um, with the COVID repatriation task force, you also see how meaningful consular work can be. So, you know, as a foreign service officer and a generalist, how we do more than just our cone per se. Um, as always, I'm excited to serve and uh, try a new role. I would just kind of we piggyback on that a bit because- add anything to that? Um, yeah, I, so I love uh, what Victoria just mentioned because it really does speak to why so many of us got into diplomacy um, and at the core it's to serve. And so obviously that looks different depending on what job you're doing, but I feel like when you're doing consular work, it's some of the most obvious, um, it's some of the most obvious service work. And like, I remember when I was in Haiti, that was where I served, uh, where, I, where I did my consular tour and having the opportunity to repatriate this minor who had been abandoned uh, by her family and place her into a safe home in the US. Um, that whole process from kind of getting her case to meeting her in person to escorting her you know, to her new home in Atlanta was some of the most fulfilling work I'll ever do. Um, and I think that's what attracts so many people to the consular cone because you get to see your impact very immediately on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so I just have an immense amount of respect for, for consular officers. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. It sounds like there, there might be a, a most popular cone to enter into. Um, so we've talked a little bit about- um, <laughs> It Political. means I have not advocated enough for public diplomacy. There were all, you'll all be PD officers by the time I'm done with you. <laughs> I know, I'm like, oh. um, so we talked a little bit about political, public diplomacy, management, and consular. There's one more, economic. I want to talk about the economic con. Sure, I'm pro-econ. <laughs> uh, so our economic officers, um, they are similar but different um, to political officers in that they're, one of their central tasks is reporting. So um, as Victoria mentioned, a political officer has to do a lot of analysis of the political situation on the ground, report that um, back to Washington, help to inform our foreign policy. An econ officer is gonna be doing the same thing, but focusing on you know, the economic situation, trade, energy, um, environmentalism, health, um, both here in Washington or overseas. And so it's, it's that same kind of reporting concept, but, um, but with the focus, of course, just being on those econ, uh, those econ categories. Anything to add to my auto to do again? I know you worked in the political affairs and um, diplomat Rufai mentioned that it's similar to political. Anything that you can share? Yeah, um, and oftentimes at missions overseas, you have a joint political economic section just because the work can overlap. Um, it could be an economic issue, but also how it could also affect the political situation and political reporting. But also as political and economic officers, we also partner with other agencies, such as if you're an economic officer, oftentimes a partner with maybe the Foreign Commercial Service from the US Department of Commerce 
the Foreign Agriculture Service from um, the Department of Agriculture, the US Trade Representative. So you are not working alone for the US Department of State, but you are basically the leading government organization overseas uh, partnering with these other um, departments to promote overall U.S. interests. One thing that I would add just quickly, um, because she just reminded me, when we say foreign service officer, we are most often talking about uh, FSOs that work for State Department, but all of those other agencies that she mentioned, if they are assigned to a mission overseas, um, those officers are FSOs as well. It's only when you say diplomat that you typically are referring to a foreign service officer who works for the State Department. That's generally the kind of layman's term um, distinguishment, just, uh, distinction. But, um, but I, I bring that up because you know we have USAID, we have CDC, we have all these folks who work overseas alongside us who are also FSOs, um, but for other agencies. Um, but because we lead um, overseas and because we are the face of the diplomatic mission, um, most often folks are talking about State Department. Thanks so much for adding um, that additional point. So before we move over into what, are the, what is the process to entering into the Foreign Service, there were a couple of questions that some of our um, attendees had pertaining to the different cones. Um, one of the questions was that, you know, are certain career tracks more competitive to get into than others? And this is from Shayna. And the second question, if you guys can answer that um, in tandem as well too, was that um, Atina shared that she's heard that most or all FSOs have to serve at least one consular tour, but do officers otherwise have opportunities to work outside of their cone? And Atina also supported that question as well too. She wants to know, do you have to work? It's one of those myths we have an opportunity to debunk. Do you have to work as a consular um, for at least the first few years, even if that's not the cone you're interested in? Um, okay, so I can take a shot at those. So. I'll start from the latter question. Um, as many things in State Department goes, it depends. So I'd say most foreign service officers will do a consular tour in their first uh, two years when you're considered an entry level officer. Some do both tours, their first two tours as consular, but also I've met foreign service officers where they didn't do a consular tour. And it all depends on the circumstances. Sometimes they go to a post. Um, we, have kind of, we have missions in countries where the consular section is one person <laughs> and something might happen in the country and that person is no longer doing consular work, they're doing something else. Or sometimes you get posted um, to an office in DC and that can count as your consular requirement. So I would say, you know, if you're very, if you're interested in the foreign service, um, count on doing a consular tour in your entry level, but it might not happen. Again, it all depends. And um, I am not on the board of examiners. <laughs> um, so I don't know the numbers if one cone is more competitive than the other, but I think the latest I've heard is that like PD, political and economic tend to attract more for foreign service officers and then you have consular and management behind. Hey there, um, so I would definitely agree. And, um, and I would say that when you take, so when you take the foreign service exam, both the written test and then the oral exam, once you've passed and you've also then passed kind of like your suitability and your background checks and all that, you go on this registrar. Um, so when you're on the register, you are listed uh, in rank order and your rank on that register is determined by not only your score that you got on that test, but also any critical languages that you might have, you'll get, bump up, you'll get a bump up for critical languages. Um, you will also get uh, additional points added for veterans preference. Um, and you can, but it's rank ordered by, by cone. So if for example, you have a hundred folks who took the test and passed, um, and of those hundred, there are 
50 that want to be public diplomacy officers. And there are 10 that want to be, you know, econ officers and 20 that want to be consular officers. If you're thinking about just the fact that there are only so many slots available in a given class, it will be then harder for the public diplomacy officers to be pulled off of that register and given a slot because, because it is divided by the cone. So depending, it really does, it's, it's flexible and it fluctuates because it depends on how many people actually pass in at the, around the same time you pass because you have 18 months to sit on the register before, before you have to retake the exam. Um, so it's, it depends on how many people actually pass around that same time. And then in addition, how many people of the same cone pass at that time. So it does play a part, um, but it does also fluctuate um, depending on the time. I, I, I'm sure that at some point in time, some cones are more popular than others. It just depends on, um, on kind of what's happening with, um, with the applicants that year. Yeah, and you kind of um, alluded to some of the things to consider throughout the application process. That's a great segue into that. Um, the best way that we found that our community has learned about processes and entering into any field or being inspired is learning about the stories for those whom they are looking to um, carry the torch. Um, and so I would like to invite the both of you to share um, your journey to becoming a foreign service officer. And as you talk about that journey, highlight some of the, the key steps in the process. That's Victoria, that, would you um, like to go for our attendees should okay. consider? Sure. So we'll start with you. Yeah, diplomat, we'll start with you. Okay. So um, I first heard of the Foreign Service when I was an undergrad. So I know at the beginning of our session, um, Marissa had mentioned that some members, you know, didn't know too much about the Foreign Service. So don't worry about that. Um, I did not know about it. Most of my public education um, and then I learned about the Foreign Service while I was studying abroad at NYU Abu Dhabi, where I met a Foreign Service officer. Um, and after being abroad and hearing about the work that Foreign Service officers do, I was very attracted to that type of work and that lifestyle. So the first step that I took was, okay, is a bachelor's good enough? Yeah, a bachelor's is good enough. So you don't need international experience. You don't need a foreign language. Um, as long as you have a bachelor's, you can take the FSOT, which is the like multiple choice exam. You go into a testing center. I'm not sure how they do it now in COVID times, but um, previously it was like you go into one of those centers where they take, where they administer the SAT, the GRE, and et cetera, like that. So I looked into um, what are the requirements? And since I had a bachelor's, I, I figured, okay, you know what, maybe I'd still like to get an MA, um, a master's. And a way to pay for that and to also give me more training and, to the, and professional development for the Foreign Service uh, was the Pickering um, Fellowship. And the Pickering Fellowship was similar to the Wrangell Fellowship. Um, both give mentorship, professional development um, in terms of skills you need for the Foreign Service, whether it's communication skills, writing skills, um, and they give you internships. So you actually, you can do the actual work of a Foreign Service officer before starting your job. And to me, that was critical because when I entered the Foreign Service, I not necessarily steps ahead, but I was prepared. Um, I, you know, had read cables before. I knew their formats. I um, had written some before. I've written other types of products we produce in State Department. Um, I staffed officials, which are some jobs that we do often in the Foreign Service and that are hard to prepare for in even graduate school. Um, so doing it at an embassy overseas or at, at Maine State, our headquarters in Washington, D.C., uh, is critical. So not to um, interrupt you, what is a red cable for folks that have no clue what that is? Oh, um, so when I was talking about uh, as a political officer, we 
interpret the situation going on and we relay that information to Washington, DC. That's basically what a cable is. It's a memo, kind of like an email um, to someone in Washington, DC explaining a situation and um, contextualizing it for US government officials. So more than what they would read in a news article, um, it gives more snippets of, you know, this is what they might be saying in the news, but based on conversations I'm having, based on what the atmosphere is, um, this is what's really happening and this is what that means. So it's basically like an analytical, a short analytical report um, because State Department writing is also not like um, graduate or undergraduate writing. It's very concise, it's punchy, it takes practice. Um, so that's another reason why my fellowship was critical to my professional development. Um, and throughout the fellowship, I also took the FSOT, um, the written exam and the oral assessment, which is the in-person interview, which is an entire day of interviewing in Washington, DC. And once you successfully pass those, enter the Foreign Service. Um, yes, I saw, just saw that uh, question. Yes, the State Department provides language training in any language you need to know. So even though in undergrad and graduate school, I studied Arabic, I have not been put in a position where I have to use Arabic as the main language. Instead, I had to use French mainly in Algeria um, with some Arabic, but the State Department taught me French. I had about 35 weeks of intense French training where it's like eight hours a day in a classroom with like three to four people and all you do every day for 35 weeks is French. And that's what I'm doing right now for Hebrew. So you can have a language coming in. And as Malika mentioned, um, if it's a critical language, it'll boost your score up on the register and it could help you get called into the foreign service sooner or you could get trained in the language. Diplomat Rufai, do you want to talk to us a little more about your journey to the Foreign Service and sprinkle in some of the, the key steps that our aspiring diplomats should consider? Yeah, absolutely. So I definitely was a bit weird uh, because I knew day one of college that I wanted to be a diplomat, and that is not the typical path at all. Um, I think most people, generally speaking, do not um, just know that this is what they want to do. Um, ironically, whenever anyone would ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, when I was a kid, I would always say president. And that was not actually what I wanted. I realized this later. I, so when I said president, what I really meant was that I wanted to be the face of the US government. I wanted to represent our interests to external audiences. And so when I got older, I realized that I was really thinking of a diplomat and not necessarily president. That was one way of going about it, sure, but that wasn't the only way. And it certainly wasn't the, um, it wasn't the way that, that subconsciously I was, I was considering. So I went into, I went to Spelman College um, in Atlanta. And uh, in my first week of orientation met with my study abroad coordinator. And I told her she was also she also covered a number of international relations programs. And I told her what I wanted to do, and had my whole little life plan, which you very quickly realize as you get older is not a real thing. But at the time, I was very proud of my little life plan. And um, uh, so I went in with, with my, my life plan and told her what I wanted to do. And so she told me about these fellowships. Uh, so I ended up applying um, and being selected for the Pickering Fellowship. And that was when the Pickering Fellowship was still being offered at the undergrad level. Um, I believe now we've just transitioned to only grad level. Um, but at the time I received it in the second semester of my sophomore year, um, and then went through a series of kind of practical 
uh, training opportunities, including internships and summer programs, all, all of course designed to um, help prepare me for the foreign service. So I was really, really fortunate in that regard, um, got to intern both domestically in uh, what was then the G Bureau is now the J Bureau, um, covering kind of human rights, democracy, um, all a whole slate of, of um, topics that I was really passionate about and still am. Um, and then also interned overseas in Nassau, working under another Pickering alum um, who gave me the full kind of enculturation into all of the cones, even though I was assigned to the public diplomacy section, I got an opportunity to work in each section with the exception of management um, to try and get my feet wet and really get an understanding of how the mission functioned and also confirm for myself whether or not I wanted to stick with public diplomacy. Um, as Victoria mentioned, I you know, also then took the test uh, the written test and the and I finished up with the oral exam when I was um, in my first year of grad school at SICE and um, and that was really kind of the start. I also forgot to mention that I started in 2013. Um, 2014 was when I went to my first assignment and I just kind of mixed that up in my brain but that's on me. Um, but I I I wanted to kind of give you that overview, but I also want to backtrack really quickly because there's a piece of my story that I personally found really important. Um, when I was in the process of applying for the Pickering Fellowship and I had just gone through the, um, I submitted my application, gone through the interview process, was super excited and like just couldn't wait to, to find out what was, um, you know, what the result was going to be. And while I was at Spelman, um, waiting to hear back, I, we also had a board of trustees meeting that day. And so the board of trustees of Spelman came onto the campus and they would, you know, have their meetings and they'd also interact with students. And I recall um, sitting down with some of my friends and this was the first year, our sophomore year, this is the first year that we were not all together in the same dorm room. And so we really valued our lunchtime because that was our opportunity to kind of reconnect and, um, and catch up on, on everything we had supposedly missed in the 24 hours since we had last seen each other. <laughs> um, and so while, while we we're in the cafeteria, one of the student government um, leaders came over and said, hey, you know, we've got our trustees coming, would you mind sitting down with them? And so in my, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, I can't really, catch up with my girls, but all right, all right, sure. So we go and we, we sit down uh, with this woman. And so, you know, we're just striking up a conversation. I'm telling her about, you know, my goals and aspirations. And she's asking me all these questions and we're talking about foreign policy and I'm just loving the conversation. And I was like, wow, this woman is fascinating. I just, this is such a great combo. So we're engaging and, um, and I told her that I had applied for the, for the Pickering Fellowship. And, um, and she goes, oh, it's a great fellowship. You know, I, you seem like you'd be a really great fit. I was like, oh, thank you so much. You know, this was, um, it, was, it was exciting to hear her say that as someone who I, of course, have been having such a stimulating conversation with. And so she said, you know, let's keep in touch. Again, exciting. And so I said, yeah, absolutely. Um, let me uh, take down your, your email address. And so she gives me her email and as she writes her name down, I like my, my heart caught in my throat <laughs> because I realized that I had been sitting there talking to Ambassador Aurelia Brazil, who is like an OG diplomat, like the queen of queens of, of diplomacy and someone who I had heard about on paper and as an international relations um, major, of course, knew all about her as not only this OG diplomat, but also a Spellman sister, and um, someone who I had had great ad admiration for just in reputation alone. So to find out that I had been sitting here for the last like 45 minutes having this conversation with her, mind blowing. And so I really took that as such a sign. I was like, everything is aligning. This is this is my sign that I'm supposed to be in the foreign service. And so. Later, fast forward a few months after I've actually gotten the fellowship, 
I go and we have um, kind of our, our entry conversation. It was, I guess it was kind of an orientation of sorts, um, but it was like a meet and greet uh, for the uh, incoming cohort and organizers and funders and things of that nature. And while there, I met with uh, Richard Hope, who was the director at the time, um, who was also a foreign service officer and, um, and had been director of, this, of the fellowship for years. Um, really uh, uh, impactful individual. And we met out in the hallway and I was saying, um, I, you know, I told him I went to Spelman and I told him my name and he goes, oh yeah, Re Brazil told me to look out for you. And I like died, just died. Because what I had not realized is that while she was at Spelman, he was at Morehouse and they were friends. And there was this whole connection that had been taking place kind of behind the scenes, aligning me with, you know, this opportunity where you just, I, 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 kind of meditate on that story so often because you never know what opportunities are going to be presented to you. But more importantly, you have to align yourself accordingly. I had already put in the work to make my application strong. I had already done the interviews. I was already a very strong student. I you know, was already committed to foreign policy and loved it. But I will never know whether or not, you know, this conversation that she likely had with, with, with Richard Hope was what put me over the edge. I'll never know that. But I can say that aligning yourself and kind of putting yourself in these positions to manifest your reality, that is important. And so I, I just offer that story because it's something I think about so often when I consider the fact that you can have faith and you can, you know, you can want things, but there is a way of manifesting them. And I truly believe that the universe aligns to, to, to help you reach your, your goals. Wow. That was so powerful. I mean, you had so many great nuggets in that, you know, from, you know, sharing with us the importance of the fellowship programs, um, networking and making sure that we show up as our best selves and notwithstanding where we are because we never know who's in the room and who can potentially serve as our advocate in the future, um, which leads into some of the questions that some of our attendees have in terms of putting their best foot forward. So Angela wants to know, you know, are there any other relevant professional experience that might be helpful, you know, for her relations or working abroad? Can she use any of that to help her? And then also I wanna attach Aria's question as well too. You know, what if she doesn't have an opportunity to participate in one of the amazing fellowship programs that both of you had opportunity to go through? What are some alternative professional development opportunities um, that she could potentially participate in? Uh, okay, so for the first question, um, any experience can count toward the Foreign Service. Um, one of the, how the examiners will assess an application is along the lines of the 13 dimensions. So those are on um, the State Department website on like careers.state.gov. You can use any of your experiences to describe your qualifications um, along those 13 dimensions. So even though some of the 13 dimensions might include cultural adaptability, it doesn't necessarily have to be about maybe you took a trip one summer to another country and had to adapt to that culture. It could also be maybe you had to move towns when you were younger, uh, maybe you started a new job or um, you were around a different group of people any way in which you would adapt. Um, so you can align your experiences to those 13 dimensions without it necessarily being an academic degree, seeking higher education like a graduate degree or working in international relations. There are a lot of people in the foreign service who 
are in the Foreign Service from other careers. It could be in the arts, lawyers, um, doctors. People come to the Foreign Service from many walks of life. So you don't have to have, you know, as some might think, if you're going to go work in banking, like a mat, an MBA and have worked in a bank before or something like that, um, as long as you can describe yourself about the work you did, your professional experience along those 13 dimensions, um, it'll be a strong representation um, of yourself. And so even if you don't get a fellowship, um, keep applying to the Foreign Service. I think um, Maritz also mentioned this at the beginning, no one is gonna ask you how many times you took the FSOT. Um, and that's something someone told me before, like if someone ever asks you that, like that person is not a good person <laughs> because that doesn't matter. That will not say anything about the caliber of person you are and the quality of work that you can perform in the foreign service. The test is free. Um, and you can take it once every year. So keep taking the test and you might get lucky the first time, the second, the third time, the seventh time. I met people who took the FSOT 11 times. Um, so keep taking it until it's your time and it works out. But if you are seeking professional development, the State Department does have other internship programs. There is the Pathways Internship Program. There are also other programs like um, Presidential Management Fellows, um, Wrangle, if you want to do more development side work, there's the Pain Fellowship. Um, and there's a Born Fellowship, I think that's mainly focused on like languages and then a career in national security. Um, so even if you don't, you know, you can apply to everything, get all your eggs um, in as many baskets as you can, um, but there are many ways to get into the Foreign Service. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, um, so you guys have given so many great insights into getting into the foreign service. Once you're in, can you talk a little more about work-life balance? That's, that's like the key question everyone always asks about any career that they're in. And we, we can start with you, um, Diplomat. Um, do you get a lot too? Because I know you have a newborn. Can you talk a little bit about how are you balancing being a mom, a wife, and a diplomat? Well, COVID has, like everything else in the world, um, put its own twist on things. But one thing I learned a few months in is, and I guess this would be at any company or any job you're in, is about like advocating for yourself, setting your boundaries, setting your limits, um, whether it's like, you know, that I've met people who go about their careers that, you know, they're here, what they say they're here, because outside of that, they have other obligations, but they're happy to accommodate with, you know, communication. Um, so work-life balance, some, sometimes it can be difficult in the foreign service, especially overseas, where it seems like your life is work because you know, 24 seven, you are a representative of the US government, something could happen and you might have to go into the embassy in the middle of your barbecue or something like that. Um, it's not easy, but communication plays a big role in that. And you know, setting those boundaries and setting those limits and being upfront and saying, you know, um, these are my hours or, you know, I'm more of a like, late person, I'm happy to stay in the office until like seven, but I would need to come in at like a later hour. And for the most part, I've seen a lot of my colleagues um, adjust and adapt and able to get the schedules that they need and the balance that they need. Um, and if, you know, I haven't worked in the private sector, but um, I'm just gonna make an assumption that it might be similar in some companies that if you feel like, okay, I need an adjustment to my schedule or something like that, um, there are ways, you know, to get that adjustment if you need it. And um, being a mom and COVID and now we're teleworking <laughs> has also been difficult, but at least what I've seen so far, our people are happy to accommodate. Um, just as long as, you know, you show up and your work quality is top notch, uh, you can make anything work. 
Yeah, Diplomat Rufai, can you share what it looks like? What is the day in the life of an FSO? So one of the reasons why I love this career is that no day is the same. Um, I think that um, Victoria will likely agree with me, but one of the things that I mentioned at the top is that you have the ability to do work in any of these five combs, right? So my first job was as a cultural affairs officer in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, Vietnam. And in that capacity, it could be, my day could look like running uh, an entrepreneurship boot camp. It um, could look like speaking in our American center. It could look like a lot of desk work around um, us evaluating grants uh, and, or grants recipients. Um, it on one day was, was uh, hosting Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg um, for a speaker program. So it, it, it was very wide ranging. Then of course in, in Haiti as a consular officer, it also kind of varied depending on what kind of consular work I was doing. So. Um, Victoria mentioned we have, you know, we have non-immigrant visas, we have immigrant visas focusing on kind of family reunification and things of that nature and adoptions and whatnot. Um, you have fraud prevention. Um, there's a lot of investigatory work there. You have American Citizen Services, which is obviously supporting Americans in any, in a wide range of situations um, that they find themselves overseas. Um, and so if you were, even within, even within the consular section where you are doing visas that all kind of seem the same, there, there can be some monotony to that, to that practice. Even within that, it, there was always something different because you're dealing with people and people are never the same. Uh, so one case may look like the case you just had, but that interaction with that person is decidedly different. And, um, and that was what made it fun. Um, then of course, as you know, as a watch officer in our operations center, that was essentially crisis management 24 seven. I was, it's a 24 seven center. So we would do shifts um, where sometimes I was working overnight. Sometimes I was working really early in the morning. Um, we were on this rotational schedule. It was everything from, um, from coordinating information within the interagency with, with, you know, between state department and um, some of our interagency partners um, discuss, monitoring the news to, to track different events going on around the world, reporting to all of the folks who needed to understand uh, and, and get our information as soon as possible. Um, but that those, those days were always different. And even now as, as a desk officer, especially a desk officer working in COVID, um, it's different because my job really is interfunctional. So a lot of people think of desk officers really as, as more of a political job. And there is a lot of political work in it, but I also have to understand all of our consular issues because they also have overlap into politics. I also have to understand all of our economic issues um, and be working to advance them. I'm doing a lot of work around COVID and vaccines right now, as um, you know, obviously so many countries are not getting the vaccine doses that they need. Um, every day looks different. And, um, and it's, it's really the reason why I continue to enjoy this career. I get bored easily. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so Diplomat Latitude Gana, can you talk to us a little about what does a day in the life look like from the lens of a political affairs officer? Um, and then as you shared that, I would like for you to answer um, Ona's question about, you know, was it what is it like representing the government as a woman of color when elected officials or government policies may be harmful? to a woman of color domestically or abroad, or when you disagree with a certain policy or action. So we'll start with, what does a day look like for you as uh, political affairs? Okay, easy questions. <laughs> um, similar to what Malika said, um, as a political officer, every day is different. Um, and that is what's so exciting about it. Um, you start your day, you come into your office, you know, 
you, I mean, everyone goes about things their own way, but I usually, you know, have like somewhat of a schedule of like, okay, um, the State Department is a bureaucracy and it works like a bureaucracy, even across time zones. So you might have official, senior officials meeting in Washington, DC. So like the Secretary of State might meet with the Assistant Secretaries and then you have other officials um, decreasing in rank, meeting with each other. And eventually whatever the priorities are for the day, come down to your office. Um, so then whatever the time difference is, you get that readout and you're like, okay, this is what's happening in Washington, DC. If there's anything that's immediate, you're like, okay, whatever my plan was for the day, let's forget about that. Um, let's work on these priorities. Or sometimes I might be like, okay, great. Let me continue doing what I was doing. So some of the things I would work on would include um, reports. And some people talk about these congressionally mandated reports, um, you might have heard of them, like the report to combat human, the human trafficking report, um, human rights report, international religious freedom report, child labor report, all those get written by political offices overseas and rewrite them by meeting with almost everyone possible in country, whether it's government officials, other diplomats, um, at activists, people at your local grocery store, your neighbors, anyone to learn what's going on. Um, and we write those reports and those do take a lot of time, but that's, you learn everything firsthand and you are an expert on that country and those issues. Sometimes even more so than people who are in Washington DC at think tanks are experts because sometimes you could read their papers and think, hmm, that's not actually how things are happening here. Um, so that's a big chunk of work and every day that can look different with your meetings. As a political officer, I also would organize events. I worked closely with the public diplomacy section and that was very fun. Um, we would organize events for like, now it's Women's History Month. So we always had a slate of programming, um, whether it's out of our American Cultural Center, whether it's throughout the country, at the ambassador's residence, um, many ways to engage and show the importance for Women's History, um, Women's History Month, and also use it as an opportunity as a political officer um, to promote women's rights and humans, human rights. Um, and then there's a lot of writing. As I mentioned before, you have to you know, keep a keen eye on what's going on and report back to Washington. So during the day, I'd have all these great meetings. I'd talk to a lot of people. I'd go back to my desk and I'd start writing. <laughs> Um, almost like when you're in grad school or undergrad and you're like crashing on a paper, um, you write your reports and basically send them back to Washington, DC. Um, so it's very fulfilling and enjoyable work. I love to learn and just like Malika and I think many diplomats, we get bored easily. That's why we like to move around every two to three years, learn new languages, live in new places, meet new people. Um, so no matter what your portfolio is, you might have a set amount of topics you cover, but what I enjoyed is that you can make it your own. Like my political portfolio included, you know, religious freedom, human rights, congrat like parliament affairs, elections. And I chose to focus a lot more on women's rights and LGBTQ rights and religious freedom, just because I found them more interesting. I met a lot of contacts who were willing to partner and we did a lot of programming together and engagement. So, you can make every day as you want to make it and um, make every day different but fulfilling. So now the second question. Um, being a woman of color representing the US government is almost like an honor because in some countries, um, a lot of the other diplomats I would meet with um, are males, <laughs> older males. Um, and oftentimes you do get questions like, oh, how can you represent this country when this is going on in your country? Um, and there are many ways you can answer those questions. And it's challenging and difficult, but what underlines all of that is that I have the opportunity to do this job. Um, and that's, you know, despite what um, the events that might happen in our country that we will be upset about and angry and frustrated about, 
we have the opportunity to represent the country and represent the American people and show the world, you know, what America is, what America looks like, and embody those values that America and we represent. And when you do disagree with certain policy or actions, as we have seen throughout history, um, some people choose to resign and um, express their disagreement um, via, you know, like media interviews and op-eds. Some people stay in government and instead choose there's a dissent channel in State Department where you can formally register your dissent and why and um, provide more context on that. And you could do it as an individual, you can do it with a group of people. Some of those um, dissent memos get leaked to the press and some of them don't. Um, so there is a way inside the institution to express your disagreement with policies and actions. And if that isn't the route that someone wants to take, you also have the option to resign from the service. And some people express it in the media, as I stated earlier, and some people just don't. Thank you so much for sharing <laughs> that. Um, Diplomat Rufai, um, you shared earlier about your enthusiasm for wanting to become a diplomat. Initially, you thought, I want to become a president, but ultimately <laughs> learned that you wanted to protect and advance American interests abroad. Mm -hmm. um, you've also served in two cones, um, you know, as consular and currently now as public diplomacy. Three. What would you like for you <laughs> representing, oh, three, what's the third one? So currently my, my desk job is technically a political job, but it's really more interfunctional, so. Ah, yeah. so consular, yeah. political and public diplomacy. I love it. Mm -hmm. Three, triple threat. Um, so what is it like, you know, representing the U.S. government as a woman of color? Um, who so I know? personally, I love this question um, because I feel like it, this is one of the reasons why so many women of color do shy away from, um, from government service. And I 100% respect that. Um, I feel like there are so many different ways to affect change. I've chosen, of course, to go about it this way. Um, but in my opinion, if you're going to affect change, you have to have folks in all different corners working towards shared interests. So you need activists, you need lobbyists, you need diplomats, you need all of these people with shared goals working to advance society for the world. And so for me, one of the reasons why I enjoy being a woman of color, specifically a black woman and a diplomat is because I feel like part of my job is to shake tables. And I think that having a seat at the table and or pulling up my own chair um, because that is often something that I have to do. Um, and so many women who look like me have to do. I feel like because I am a person who is unafraid to speak truth to power, my voice is going to be more impactful from that space um, than it might be outside. So I have, um, I have really good friends of mine who have left the foreign service for excellent reasons. Um, and who are doing really great work outside of the department. Um, I likewise have amazing friends who are still in the foreign service and still advancing those interests. But I feel like for me, there are two parts to, to this issue. One is that as a diplomat, as a foreign policy practitioner, we have to be really honest, especially from a public diplomacy perspective, we have to be really honest about what the United States actually is and what it is not. And when we talk about democracy and advancing our ideals, we understand, I think, I think you know, people of color, black women understand more than most that America is not perfect, it is aspirational. The ideals that we, you know, that we talk about when we're overseas these are aspirational goals. We are not there yet, 
we're absolutely not there yet. We do, however, do a good job of setting up from an institutional level, the opportunities for us to get to where we need to be. So working on things like, you know, institutional reform and focusing on how we create better spaces to affect change, that for me is very important. I also always consider the fact that as a diplomat, one, I'm always going to be publicly nonpartisan. Obviously, as an individual, I have my own personal perspectives and I will never claim to not have, I'll never claim to not have an, an opinion. However, our job 100% is to be nonpartisan. And I think that most of us take that incredibly seriously. Um, that does not mean, of course, that you don't use the dissent channel. That doesn't mean that you don't speak truth to power. You absolutely can and should do that. And I certainly do. <laughs> um, but I do so in a way that I feel like is, is most effective for me. Um, and I have been really focused in my role as, you know, a PERCA board member, in my role just generally as your average everyday foreign service officer, in making sure that at every turn, I'm creating opportunities not only for people who come behind me, um, but also to make us a more effective organization. It's not effective to pretend that the United States does not have issues. It's not effective. It's not efficient when you're going overseas and everyone can see what's happening on your news. Everyone knows what is happening in the United States, often more, more so than, than some folks in, in the United States. Um, and so I think that our power is in our ability to speak honestly about the aspirations of the United States and about where we want to be as a country and how we are setting ourselves up to get there. Um, so I feel like for, for me, being a Black woman as, and a diplomat only gives me more, more authority to speak on these things um, because it does hit different when someone who has to deal with, you know, with injustice on a, on a regular basis and, you know, in our lived experiences um, can then go and speak to people who are having similar experiences in other countries and talk about how do we get, how do we collectively get to a better place as a world? How do we globally work on these issues in partnership as opposed to preaching? Because historically, one of the problems that we have had as a country is that we will preach to other countries. And I think that the diplomats of today, at least those that I'm you know, honored to call colleagues, fully understand that this work has to be done in partnership and we're all just trying to reach the same goals. Powerful, powerful. Um, spoiler alert into our first GAD publication. We're actually gonna have a, a series of diplomacy town halls talking just about that in terms of, you know, America's is aspirational, but we want all the current diplomats and future diplomats to come together through a series of talks to collect information and position statements so that we can publish this and send it over to the State Department and Congress. Um, so I, you're definitely going to be a, a guest writer on that if you're open to that, if your role will allow you that along with diplomat Latitude Gana as well too. For those, every reason you just stated is the premise as to why um, our team decided last year to host this town hall because we think it's very important for us to talk about it, especially since diversity um, is becoming um, everyday chatter now and people are wanting to be more intentional about it. And so we would be remiss if we wouldn't, wouldn't take that opportunity to um, truly share what are some of the best practices um, as to what we can do to move our country forward. Um, I love that you also talked about, you know, this is also a real um, reason why a lot of our aspiring leaders don't even consider the field. And we have to keep in mind that, and I think actually take a step back. I think last year a uh, statistics came out that it was the lowest number 
of applicants for the Foreign Service. And so with that, we have to keep in mind of the new generation that's coming in that's socially responsible. I know for myself, I see it all the time at our firm, through some of the CSR work that we're doing, that you know companies are losing employees because they're saying, you know, if you're not standing for a, a public good, then I no longer want to work for you, which is new to the industry. We're seeing in policy in my work in government relations where um, you know the, the public is putting pressure on members of Congress and leadership to even shift their positions. And I've been in the lobbying space for about five years as a practitioner and 15 years as just um, an American advocate that was passionate. Um, I have never seen the leadership switch their um, priorities. <laughs> so, you know, there, we have a new generation that's coming in. And so I think it it's very important that um, the next generation of leaders that's going to represent our interests at the forefront can do so from a place of patriotism, but also from a place of, um, that's a realistic as well too. So I love that you shared um, the grace that we need to have on our beautiful country that a lot of us don't even realize just how beautiful it is, even with all its flaws until we travel abroad or we we face some of the things that we're facing now. And if we if we were to read this in any other country, they would plummet, but our country is still thriving. We're still coming to work. You're still on, you know, participating in um, webinars like this to give back. And you all are still saying, notwithstanding what's going on in my country, I still want to join the service. And you took a time tonight to attend um, today's event. So with that, before I turn it over to our um, diplomats to close out with their top two advice for you all as you consider entering into this amazing field, I wanted to give a couple of you all to just kind of share what are some of your biggest takeaways and take about just 30 seconds. You can come off mute and just quickly introduce yourself to where you're joining us from and just a quick takeaway that you um, receive from our amazing guest diplomats for today. I'm, a, I'm an aspiring professor, so I would love to practice. <laughs> I don't mind calling some folks out in the in the chat box. Um, Angela, you gave some thanks in the chat box. You want to share um, your biggest takeaway from our guest diplomats today? Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you both for taking your time. Um, I'm joining from DC. Um, I really appreciated this because I, I work uh, as an implementing partner on USA programming abroad. So it was, I, I've always thought about foreign service in the back of my head. One of my best friends is currently um, an officer in Ankara. And I've, I've kind of been going back and forth about thinking about next steps in my career. And so I guess my biggest takeaway um, was hearing a little bit more about the cones and, and kind of being able to hear uh, your firsthand experience um, rather than things that are kind of like hearsay in terms of what uh, people's preferences might be versus what things might seem more glamorous because at the end of the day, it's public service. Um, and so, and also just really appreciated hearing your guys' uh, experiences as women of color representing the US, um, especially with you know uh, all the events that and the conversation and dialogue that have been emerging over um, the last year or two, particularly it's, it's, um, it, it's kind of a reminder to that, you know, we, we help shape the legacy of this country and foreign service is a really important way to do that. And um, therefore, I just, I really appreciate your guys' words on that. Thank you so much for sharing. Syria, you wanna share why you're further um, interested in joining the foreign service? I know you put in the chat box, America's not perfect, it is aspirational. Yes, um, so it's always, as mentioned before, it's, I, uh, like the person before me mentioned, it has been in the back of my head as well. But it's, I, I saw the post and I figured why not uh, join. And as I was listening, it, it honestly seemed very engaging. But my biggest takeaway would have to be just how nonpartisan someone does have to be. And it makes sense that you have to be completely nonpartisan in issues. And I saw one of the questions being asked by. I believe 
And it was like, how would you as a woman of color handle situations which you find yourself would disagree and could be harmful to other people of color? And how do, how do you address that? And just the challenge in itself and how the process or uh, how can I, sorry, <laughs> how do I further explain it? But just the, the mechanism that goes behind it just seems intriguing, if that makes sense. Powerful, and we'll have a final participant share her insights. I think as Aida shared um, more so what she gathered from the public diplomacy front, um, you can go ahead and go live and share your feedback. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Ira Liz Kino, and I'm she, her, hers, and I'm based in Chicago. And um, so I've been an aspiring public dip diplomat since I was 16. I actually celebrate my 10th year of pursuing this career last Friday when I turned 26. Um, so it's really reassuring to hear, um, like, diplomat um, uh, uh, Rufa, Rufai. I'm sorry if I like not saying it right. Um, that public diplomacy at its core is just very much like um, like rallying um, different stakeholders um, to do good. And um, it's always like my dream job has always intimidated me. And tonight it was very assuring to know that like um, what I'm doing right now in my current position, um, working with Chicago communities and Chicago youth actually prepares me to be a good public diplomat someday. Thank you so much for sharing your takeaways and feedback. Um, guest diplomats, your top two advice. I know you guys gave so many advice today, <laughs> tonight, and we'll definitely be inviting you guys back for some of our, our other segments, but what are the top two pieces of advice or insights that you would like to leave our aspiring diplomats with or stakeholders in the, in the field like myself with? What are some insights or feedback you would like to leave us with? And any of you guys can go first. I see Matt Rufai checking in. <laughs> um, so first and foremost, what I would offer you is that you are absolutely 100% worthy and capable of entering the foreign service or literally anything that you want to do. I often hear, you know, people talk about imposter syndrome and all of this, forget that you've got this 100%. As long as you're focusing on preparing and showing up as your best self, there is nothing that you cannot achieve and that absolutely includes the foreign service. So I just wanna make that my first, my first piece of advice. Um, secondary to that, when you do achieve, as you absolutely will, when you do reach your goals, remember that there are other people behind you and pull them along with you. At every point in your career, at every stage, when there is an opportunity for you to offer assistance, to lean in, to support, especially other women and other women of color, um, take those opportunities because as it's actually kind of one of one of the, my favorite things that um, Kamala Harris says, the POTUS. Ooh, ooh. Um, she talks about how you know her mother would often say, "You're going to be the first to do many things. Just make sure you're not the last." And I, it that resonated with me so much because it really is um, a lesson that, or a, a principle really that I've seen in my own lifetime and time again. Um, and so I just encourage you all to keep that front of mind in any space that you operate as you move forward in your careers. Powerful. As you can tell, I love saying your name. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so for those who are thinking of entering the foreign service in the middle of applying, um, take the FSFT, just take it whenever it's next available. Many people who I talk to um, say, okay, they want to study, they might take it, you know, in a year or something, but you're, you're taking away an opportunity from yourself by waiting longer. So just take it, get a feel for it. If you don't pass, it's okay. Um, you're just getting practice the more times you take it. Um, so just 
keep taking it, treat every day as a learning opportunity because the FSOT is more about a breadth than depth of information. So anything that interests you along the way, whether it's like a documentary, you don't know much about a podcast, a book or anything like that, explore and take in as much knowledge as you can every day. Um, so take the FSOT, absorb that breadth rather than depth and focus on those 13 dimensions, that's point one. Number two, similar to what um, Malika said, um, you are needed in the foreign service. So you are capable, but you are also needed. So, you know, when you're thinking, is this the career for me? Can, I, it is about service. There are many ways you can serve your country, but you are very needed in the foreign service. Um, so I hope that plays a role in your calculus for applying. And once you are in the foreign service, um, there is a community that you can lean on. Um, people who are going through similar um, experiences as you as one of our questions asked, you know, what is it like to be a woman of color? What is it like to be a mother? If you're single, what is it like to be single or anything like that? Any difficulties you have, any questions you want, there is community in the foreign service. Um, there are many groups that people have, whether, um, you know, they're like employment, like association groups, informal groups on Facebook, networks you build yourself. Um, but there is like a foreign service family and there is community. So once you're in, um, you're not alone. Um, so as you continue to bring up people behind you, you also don't have to share a burden. Um, you, you don't have to hold a burden by yourself. You can share it. And um, there are people who will help you in the service too. Wow. Thank you so much to our outstanding guest diplomats, Duguid Nalator Tu and Diplomat Rufai for your time today. Um, you have no idea how much you've impacted um, the lives of those who have joined us today and the lives of those who had opportunity to gain access to this recording, over 1300 that's part of the WCAPS network and so much more. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, we will keep you in our, our prayers. Um, we will keep rooting for you. I know when you guys have those hard days and you might not have someone to reach out to, just remember us here at WCAPS GAD. Um, and we look forward to bringing you back. Um, as you guys know, the views and opinions expressed at this event are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any agency of the US government. Please do stay in touch with us. We can be reached at GADWG, so that's G-A-D-W-G at WCAPS.org for more information about our future programming, our series, our upcoming um, conferences, and most importantly, we're recruiting this entire month to join our teams. Um, so if you have ideas about future programming or things you'd like for us to see, um, or just would love to be a part of the network and find a tighter knit family within WCAPS, we invite you to also email us at gadwg at wcaps.org and shoot us your resume and put subject line officer. We would love to have you join our amazing team. Our next meeting is April 6, 2021, same time from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, Ambassador Bonnie, for joining us today. Um, I don't know if you had any final last words to close us off for today's programming. Uh, no, Maritza, thank you. I mean, I think this is a great panel. Uh, I wanna thank the panelists too for, for doing this and also for the audience for joining. I thought they were great questions. So. Thanks to you, Maritza, again, for another great event. So thanks to you and Gad. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Have a, a great evening. Take good care and stay safe in the season. <laughs>